question number one, uh, Deputy Speaker. In the New Decade New Approach document, the British and Irish Government set out a number of priorities for the Executive, including increasing police numbers uh, to 7,500. However, the funding package accompanying NDNA falls well short of the amount needed to deliver all these priorities. In terms of length of process, therefore, the key factor to increase police numbers to 7,500 will, will be the availability of Executive funding. I met the Justice Minister prior to setting the budget in 2021, and at that point the PSNI's proposals to increase police numbers were still under development. The Department of Justice has subsequently submitted a strategic outline business case seeking fin Department of Finance approval for the PSNI to proceed to the outline business case stage for additional 600 officers at a cost of £40 million per annum. Subject to the outcome of this the appraisal process, it will be for the Department of Justice to bid for any additional funding. The Executive will consider this in light of the funding available. I call Tom Buchanan for supplementary. Speaking, I thank the Minister for his response. It's disappointing that uh, the money still hasn't been delivered for, uh, to increase the police uh, as is in the new decade, new approach. Can the Minister give any indication or any timeline when he intends to come to this House with a more positive response to say that the money is now being delivered uh, for, to uh, deliver on the commitment? That's in the new decade, new approach to bring the police up to the quota that they are looking for. Well, can I say in the first instance, if the money had been delivered by the government as they pro proposed and promised, there would be no question over how we're trying to. Uh, the executive has to try and meet these uh, commitments, uh, and I have no doubt the, the NDNA commitments are ones which the executive take very seriously. There are a range of commitments, uh, but what we have to do is get a process. We couldn't agree on the 11th of January and start going out to recruitment of police and officers on the 12th of January. So there's a process, and I've engaged with the Department of Justice, and they've indicated the outline business case that they're preparing to move to a business case. That's the process that has to be got through. And then, when that process reaches its conclusion and a proposition is brought to the executive, then I have no doubt the executive, uh, because part of our uh, return to here was to honour the commitments that we had made uh, in relation to a uh, new decade, new approach uh, document. Uh, it would be much better if the government would honour their financial commitment to that, and then, as I say, there wouldn't even be the need for a conversation in the executive as to how these things will be funded. I now call Jerry Carl. Question two. My assessment is that a 2.65% of pay bill, the 2019-20 Civil Service Pay Award, represents an above-inflation pay rise. I call Jerry Carl for supplement. I thank the Minister for his reply, even if it was short. But uh, in a previous debate, his own party colleague, Mr O'Dowd, referenced the need to tackle low pay, something I would agree with. And given the fact that civil service workers uh, have been working hard throughout the pandemic and for many years, a lot of them have been forced to take up an extra job um, throughout that period. Will the Minister commit to paying civil service workers an above, uh, pay, an above inflation pay offer to help deal with the extra costs uh, and the pressures of everyday life, especially those associated with COVID-19? Well, I, I, I fully accept, and, and that's why we voted for the budget, to, to give low-paid workers an increase. I, I think the member didn't vote for it himself. Uh, so I fully accept that workers uh, are under pressure in these regards, and that's why we did make an, an offer to the trade unions. Unfortunately, they couldn't fully consult on it because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, but the uh, overall award is worth 2.65% on the civil service payable. Uh, the uh, award for civil servants in the lowest pay grade was 3%. That's a further 2% increase on 2019, which means the lowest paid civil servants received a 5% increase in the, across the last two years. And I fully recognise uh, the commitment of, of very, very many of our civil service uh, who have stepped up to the plate over the course of this pandemic and the emergency we faced. Uh, and I think it's important to recognise that with an above uh, inflation pay, pay rise, is what I have offered. And I call Alan Chambers. Question three. That's can accord with your permission. I, I attend the group questions three, eight and twelve, uh, as they are all asked in response to the audit office, audit office's update on the report on the land web system. Uh, I fully accept the findings of the audit office report published on the 16th of June, and my department is implementing its findings. 
The PSA, PSE report from 2010 made eight recommendations. Most of those have been implemented. One that remains outstanding is related to the contractual arrangements for land web and measures to demonstrate value for money. The Audit Office report acknowledges that the cost savings of £1.8 million were negotiated as part of the 2019 to 2021 contract extension. I expect further improvements will be secured from negotiations on the arrangements for delivering the service after 2021, when the current land web agreement expires. Those negotiations have already started and are being led by the Permanent Secretary uh, from my department. The Audit Office has welcomed that and the involvement of the British Government Commercial Functions Complex Transactions Team. Two of the PAC recommendations were on fees charged by the Land Registry. These were addressed when a revised fee fees order was introduced in 2014. However, a combination of an increase in property transactions and improved efficiency in the land registry saw surpluses generated again from 2017 onwards. My department is working on a new fees order that will take effect from 2021. I cannot say anything further on these issues at the minute, as the Public Accounts Committee have indicated their intention to take evidence on the Audit Office report on land web and indeed have prioritised it to be their first session in September. As members should be aware, the PAC have primacy on considering NIAO reports. And while matters are under consideration by that committee, I must be careful not to be seen to preempt or prejudge either the PAC report or the subsequent ministerial response. Call Alan Chambers for supplementary. Speaker, uh, Minister, uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, would you uh, or would you see yourself uh, given consideration to possibly excluding BT from any future competition? Well, I'm not sure that it would be legal to set out to exclude someone now before the negotiations have been entered into. Uh, so clearly, uh, I don't doubt from the reading of the PAC report, from the handling of it, bear in mind this contract was awarded in 1999 uh, and has been reviewed since. So, uh, and clearly, the PAC or the, NA, uh, the Audit Office report has thrown up uh, questions uh, and, and issues which need to be addressed. And I don't doubt that they will form part of the consideration in terms of renewing a contract. Uh, but the contract will be up uh, for renewal in 2021. And obviously, uh, we can't preclude anyone from being involved in it. But we will certainly, I'm sure, look at the lessons learned from the handling of the previous PFI contract. Call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers today. Does the Minister recognise that the, the land web project was not value for money, considering the original contract was £46 million and by April 2019 it was almost £100, 100 million. And also, how did we justify the continuous extensions from 2016, bringing us to an excess cost of over £107 million, almost to date? Well, as I say, this was a PFI contract which was awarded in 1999 when PFI was uh, touted as the answer to quite a lot of a few public expenditure issues. Uh, and quite clearly, the experience has been, uh, however, some of those contracts have worked, the experience has been that some of them have not worked as they were intended and they uh, arguably didn't represent value for money. Uh, so I don't have uh, an issue in terms of that. I think there are lessons that need to be learned in relation to all of that. I don't want to preempt what the Public Accounts Committee will find in terms of its consideration of the report, uh, but undoubtedly we are taking steps uh, to legislatively de deal with the, the charging issue, and that will be done by 2021. It couldn't be done over the three-year period when the Assembly was down. Uh, but we will take steps to, to deal with that, and obviously we will begin the discussions in relation to the replacement of that contract, uh, and I, I, would, I would anticipate and ensure that the lessons that are learned from this report are part of that consideration. I call William Irwin for supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the Minister for, for his responses. Uh, can I ask the Minister, will those overcharged be reimbursed? Uh, I just... This is the trouble with taking three questions at once. Uh, I, I understand, as you say, from, from, from reading this, that the, uh, the charges wouldn't be reimbursed. Uh, the report acknowledges the Department was unable to reduce an, a new fees order to manage surplus fees due to the absence of the Assembly, and the Department urgently, is urgently progressing a revised fees order to be in place by 2021. The fees collected by the Land Registry over the last three years were lawfully levied under the legislation in force at that time. There is no statutory provision under which the Department could return any portion of the fees levied in the past. 
Moving on, I call William Humphrey. Mr Deputy Speaker, question number four. Between the 26th of March and the 26th of June, the Department has made 23,658 payments of the Small Business Support Grants worth a total of 236.58 million to businesses here. I know that many members recognise that this has been an exceptional effort by the staff working in very challenging conditions. In total, 24,768 applications were made to the £10,000 Small Business Grant Scheme. As of the 26th of June this year, 23,532 applicants, or 95 per cent of all applications received, had been notified of the outcome. 432 applications are still being processed by Latin Property Services. In almost all of these cases, the Department's waiting for information or clarification from the applicant. I call William Irwin. For his answer, and I thank Her Majesty's Government and the Northern Ireland Executive for the easements to Northern Ireland business. Small business is the backbone of the Northern Ireland economy, and the support that they've been receiving is hugely important. I welcome those figures. Those are, those are figures which show the importance of the union to Northern Ireland. And can I ask the Minister then, going forward, in terms of small business, those that who haven't yet received uh, information in their application, how quickly can we get that to them so that those small businesses can survive and, and, and jobs be preserved as we go forward? Well, the, the, the member may be aware, uh, it, it may be part of my second discussion here at the Assembly, that a total of £63 million across the three business support schemes, the 10K grant, the 25K grant and the Business Hardship Fund has been surrendered back unspent. Now, well, 53 million, sorry, 65 million has been unspent, 53 million has been returned uh, and some money has been held on for legal purposes by the Department for the Economy. Uh, and so the executive did have a discussion in relation to how we would use that £53 million pounds yesterday. Uh, it, it was just a, a preliminary discussion, if you like, in relation to that. Uh, and there is a strong desire, I think, across the executive to address some of those sectors that manage to fall through the cracks. I think of things like social economy, childcare, uh, sole traders, which is a very difficult to, uh, uh, category to deal with, uh, and, and some other sectors which, which have not managed to avail of any of the support packages put together to date. So we are going to continue a discussion. My own department has done a piece of work in assessing the cost uh, if we were to address some of those sectors and what use of that 53 million that the Department of Economy have surrendered back uh, can be made. Moving on, I call Mervyn Story. Speaker, question number five. The use of construction line reduces tendering costs by removing the need for suppliers to submit their annual accounts each time they apply for, to tender for a construction contract. This is particularly beneficial for smaller firms as it means valuable resources can instead focus on delivering projects. Given the impact of the pandemic, it's more important than ever that construction projects are brought to the market as quickly as possible. And Construction Line also saves buyers time by providing standard assessment of each supplier's financial standing. Thank the Minister for reading what the Department gave to him. Undoubtedly, the, the issue is always, when we come to this House, it is how the Department views itself on many of these things. Uh, sadly, there are many in the construction business that wouldn't share the positive response in terms of the practical help that construction line and the procurement process, and the Minister knows that this is an issue. I've written to him on a number of times. Can the member come to question? Will, will he, and he made reference specifically to post-COVID, will he give an assurance that there will be serious consideration given to the help that is needed to allow companies to proactively be involved in procurement through construction line in a way that is beneficial to them to start the economy again in Northern Ireland? Well, as he, he would probably know construction line is a private sector company that provides a service uh, which, which is useful in terms of that procurement process because it gives that financial assessment of companies and, and, uh, and, and their, uh, the the, it offers various levels of registration. Annual fees are proportionate to suppliers' turnover. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I would, I would Im imagine that those who are, are using it and find benefit to it uh, do feel that it is of some benefit. Uh, I, I recognise what he says in terms of procurement. It's, it is a key discussion for us coming out of uh, this. Uh, and I mean, even in response to the last question about the business support grants. The ability, when pressed, of a department to turn things around quickly, and that applied across all departments, applied in health and applied to other departments, to turn things around which ordinarily would have taken months and months of consultations of maybe pilot schemes and all of that, to turn them around quickly and be 95% uh, 
uh, effective thus far in terms of small business grants, I think is, is remarkable. So I think if we apply the lessons that we have learned from the experience of the pandemic to how departments can be proactive, how they can go out and engage with sectors, how they can ensure they talk to sectors and see uh, how they can be of best help to uh, return uh, the economy to, to full uh, as full uh, 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 throttle, if you like, as, as possible. Uh, and clearly construction is a key part of that. Uh, and, and public sector procurement of construction is a key, is the key part of construction. So we have been working in terms uh, of CPD and engaging with the construction industry about the safety of returning. We have also instructed departments to bring forward projects to make sure that all of those issues uh, which would hold projects up are brought so that they're at a point of readiness so when, when construction can get back fully in operation as it is currently doing then, we are ready to go with projects. So we want to streamline this process as much as we can and ensure the engagement with the construction sector works as best it can. Of course, we have to protect the public purse. That's part of our responsibility. But I think the experience over the pandemic shows we can do both. We can do things better and we can do them at pace and we can still uh, continue to make sure there's, there's proper accountability for public finances. I call Andy Allen. Over the last 12 months and covering two financial years, 2019-20 and 2021, the executive has received Barnet consequentials of 847.6 million resource Dell and 152.3 million, 152 million, point, point million sorry, capital Dell, and a reduction in the financial transactions capital of 57 million. This includes farm support payments of 278.6 million, which replace the EU common agricultural policy payments. In addition, the executive received Barnet consequentials of uh, 1,442,000,000 to address the impacts of COVID-19. Call Andy Allen for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers uh, and outline, outlining the additional funding, the important funding received from the UK Government. The Minister will no doubt be aware of the additional €30 million announced back in March, which seems like a long time ago, uh, by the Chancellor for Changing Places Toilet Fund. Um, and I do believe there is no Barnet consequentials due to us in respect of that. But can the Minister maybe outline what engagement he's had with executive colleagues, particularly the Minister for Communities, regarding setting up a similar fund for Northern Ireland? Ireland? Well, I have engaged with all my executive colleagues uh, and what we do on a very regular basis is we bring back, back a discussion in relation to uh, much of the COVID money that we have received uh, has been spent uh, because we wanted to get business support out. Uh, obviously, the primary uh, function we had over the last while was ensuring the health service was able to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and then that uh, sort of protection that you're referring to in relation to vulnerable, vulnerable people. So that was the three broad areas. Uh, and we have allocated uh, quite a substantial proportion of the COVID-related Barnet consequences that we got. Uh, I continue to engage with the executive colleagues as late as yesterday uh, as part of the monitoring round and the reprioritization and some COVID money was spent then as well to ensure that we have a collective view of what the priorities are going forward. There, of course, we will know always many more bids for funding from the departments that is available to distribute to them. Uh, but the executive uh, set itself priorities in terms of those three key areas when we were responding to the pandemic. We're now moving into a phase where we're trying to emerge from that and, and to ensure that the economy is kick-started and that vulnerable people continue to be supported, that the health service is still able to do what it has to do. Uh, and so that discussion will happen on a very frequent basis uh, with all of the ministers individually and collectively, and we'll ensure that whatever the executive's priorities are, as met, are met as best we can. Members, we are ahead of schedule and there are only four listed questions remaining to be asked, so I will be taking further supplementaries uh, after the original questioner has their opportunity. I now call Jonathan Buckley. Question number seven. I'm pleased to say that I took the decision to support all businesses here because of the COVID-19 with rates and exemption from uh, the 1st of April. That rate relief applied to 55,000 properties and included the commercial, manufacturing and service sectors, which are not supported in Britain, yet most businesses have suffered uh, from COVID-19. I then increased this to a four-month rates holiday, which will save businesses in total some £135 million. A targeted rate relief scheme will then operate from the 1st of August to provide rate support in the reg region of 30,000 businesses, while the, uh, with the particular sectors identified as having the greatest need following research carried out by the University of Ulster. The sectors included our retail, with some exceptions, hospitality, leisure, tourism and childcare, and our three main airports. This will save businesses an additional £178 million in business rates. 
It is important to remember that a raft of other reliefs and exemptions will continue after 1 August, such as industrial derating, charitable exemptions and small business rate relief, to name just a few. Well, Jonathan Buckley for supplementary. And, and the Minister will know, because I have corresponded with him on this issue, that this is a crucial lifeline for businesses. You talk to business out there, this is the very reason why they will continue trading. But we need a clear, definitive list in relation to the targeting, with a creative approach from his department to help those businesses that might fall through the crack. Can the Minister, uh, given the support that this relief, this exemption will bring, to mitigate the loss this year, can he in indicate any further measures which he may bring forward for his department to look at to assist business with recovery going forward? Well, we, uh, as far as rates relief is concerned, we have taken that process up to the end of the financial year. Uh, there may be merit, uh, and I, I certainly will continue to consider other sectors, uh, but you remember that then comes off the executive's uh, budget, so we, we need executive uh, approval for all of that. Uh, in terms of support, and, uh, and that, that has been a huge support to business, the, the rates relief, the uh, business support grants, all of those uh, have been hugely valuable. And I understand some businesses may not have been able to avail of them for a variety of reasons, but uh, those that have, it has been a lifeline, as you say, uh, for them. The, we are anticipating some announcements from uh, Treasury over the course of the next number of weeks in relation to uh, support for economic recovery. Uh, and so the executive will obviously watch those and the Department of Finance will watch those uh, with close attention uh, to see uh, if there are any consequences that flow to us from that. And of course, then the executive is very much focused now on economic recovery uh, and whatever we can add to that particular pot, we will do so. And we are looking at other areas such, such as the, uh, the Peace Plus money, uh, financial transactions capital, better usage of that uh, investment fund uh, and other pots of money which may become available to the executive that we can use to assist in terms of economic recovery. So that's very much the focus uh, at, now, at the executive at the moment. I call Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and for the Minister. And thank you very much indeed for your remarks so far, Minister. You will be aware as Chairman of the Finance Committee that I have been asked to talk with other regional finance committees to talk about being able to get to a point where we, as part of we're looking towards the future financial settlement, that we're looking to deal with some specific issues. And one of those is about reduction in VAT and the importance of that. Can I ask the Minister, in bearing us some support for business as well, would he join us and talking directly to the Chancellor to say that we would wish to see VAT reduced to 15% or lower if we can? Well, I have an ongoing and regular discussion with the Treasury. I spoke to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury on Friday afternoon, I think, uh, and we, range, uh, we raise a range of issues, as do the Scottish and Finance uh, Minister and the Welsh Finance Minister as well. Uh, and tourism and hospitality, uh, as he uh, will understand, is, is one of the sectors most uh, deeply affected by this and one of the sectors which will struggle to recover uh, because whatever they can save of the summer season will quickly be lost and then they're into a very lean time of the year again. So we, we will continue to press the Treasury on a range of measures. We're talking to them uh, in relation to APD. Uh, we'll continue to talk to them about VAT. We, we understand that there are some considerations going on over there uh, in relation to what they do with these issues. So we want to ensure that our interests are represented and, and things that we consider may be beneficial to our sectors here are very much on that table. I call Sinead Ennis. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the Minister will appreciate the need for public services to work um, efficiently. Um, with that in mind, I'd like to ask the Minister, can he give um, an update on the new decade, new approach commitment to review arm's length bodies? Yes, the, uh, the, uh, I have brought a paper to the Executive in, in the last uh, number of weeks. It was a commitment uh, in, uh, from the new decade, new approach that we would uh, view with, uh, with, with a view to uh, rationalisation, uh, take a, an analysis of the arms and bodies. The Executive agreed my own approach. What we have done now is circulate a questionnaire, if you like, around the various departments, uh, and then we're going to make an assessment of the, the arms and bodies and, and associated bodies, non government, uh, non departmental government bodies as well. Uh, and make an assessment uh, of their value, of their role, uh, of what they contribute in the here and now, and how we may be able to do things better in future in terms of more efficiency. So when that assessment is complete, we'll bring the paper back to the executive for a discussion on the future of arms and bodies in line with our commitment under NDNA. Can I remind members to connect their supplementary question to their original question, or I may not permit it to be put. Moving on, I call Claire Bailey. Deputy Speaker. Uh, 
The executive is able to access up to £200 million pounds for, of borrowing for capital purposes in 2021. However, the executive is not currently facing pressures on its capital budget, which would require it to access borrowing. This will be kept under review. The, it should also be remembered that borrowing cannot be used to fund resource costs unless the Treasury agree to a capital to resource switch. The executive cannot introduce charges that would be considered a tax or levy without prior approval from the Treasury. How the department, however, departments can and do charge for services they provide where this is considered appropriate. With the significant additional funding provided for the COVID-19 response, the majority of departmental budgets are still to be used for the purposes to provided in the Budget 2021. The second voting account, which has been approved, simply provides the legislative authority for departments to spend the additional funding that has been allocated. It does not indicate that the executive is at risk of running out of funds. Therefore, while the position will be kept under review as the executive develops its recovery plan, it is not considered necessary to borrow at this stage. I call Claire Bailey for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his, his answer there. And I'm sort of keen to look at the underspend that has happened with COVID so far. And the Minister has told us that there was 52 million, I think, in one of his previous answers there from the business support package scheme that was unspent. Um, it, is it possible to use that money um, to redirect it to those businesses and people who have fell between the cracks? I mean, for example, yesterday I was speaking to the arts sector um, and they're engaging with us cross party wide, um, most of which have received absolutely nothing and they're crying out for a hardship fund or some sort of rescue fund package. Um, and could we use or allocate money to try and save this sector? Yes, I mean, I think in response to a previous question, I'd said that I think it was £65 million pounds was actually unspent. Uh, the Department of Economy have held on to a proportion of that uh, to deal with legal matters, uh, but £53 million was surrendered back to the executive, and we had a discussion at the executive yesterday, yesterday, I think, yeah, today is Tuesday, uh, yesterday, in relation to what to do with that. And there, is, uh, there are different views, but I know there is a keenness around the executive to try and and address some of the issues I referred to. Social enterprises uh, uh, is, is one of the issues. Uh, there are a number of other sectors. Uh, that the, the, the multiple premises are another sector that feel that they haven't properly been addressed in relation to that. But there are uh, uh, child care is another one. There are a range of sectors that perhaps weren't available, able to avail of that. Some of them didn't quite fall into the charities bracket. Some of them didn't fall into the business bracket, and they fell between them. It, one thing you learn uh, over the last couple of months is, is there's such a huge variety and complexity in the businesses that we have here uh, that it's very hard to design a scheme that will capture absolutely everybody. So yes, that 53 million that was surrendered back can be reallocated. Uh, there is a discussion ongoing. Uh, my own department's doing a piece of work in relation to some of those sectors that we have identified that came to us, and I'm sure came to economy, and probably came to a lot of representatives here as well and said, you know, we have missed out on every single pot available uh, and to see can we put together packages to provide to support uh, to some of them. But bear in mind, the, once you move out of the rate space as a, as a, a tool for de deciding who's in business, it gets more and more complex to actually verify who is in business and what they're doing and where they are and what support they need. But uh, that shouldn't prevent us trying our best to, to do that. I call Matthew Tull for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In relation to the question that Claire Bailey asked about borrowing powers, would the Minister agree that Northern Ireland faces a long term crisis in investment? The major challenge in our economy is that we have underinvested for decades. We have low productivity and low skills. Therefore, the fact that we um, are not investing enough, that we have consistent capital underspends, including the financial transaction capital, is not acceptable. And would he quickly also agree with me that it's worth com communicating to the Prime Minister in London that there are far better bits of investment that this economy needs than a boondoggle, a crackpot scheme to build the bridge between Scotland and Northern Ireland that will probably ne and he should stop gaslighting us by coming up with preposterous ideas like that. Well, I don't think anybody apart from himself takes himself seriously in these issues. Uh, 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 and I mean, if ever you want a distraction story, that's one to go for. Uh, but uh, I have to say, in relation to fin financial transaction capital, yes, it is unacceptable. Uh, that, that, that so much of it is not available, of, and that goes straight back. Uh, I think there's something like 20 million we could perhaps carry over, but that goes back to Treasury. The, there was to have been legislation passed in Westminster last year to change the status of the Housing Executive to allow it to avail of, an, uh, avail of some of that, and that would have improved the situation. That didn't happen because it ran out of legislative time. Uh, and the Department, I think, later today will be bringing the final stage through of a bill which deals with that issue. They, and once we've got that fixed, we now fall into the situation where we haven't been able to spend capital. So we probably will end up, for different reasons, facing into a capital underspend, possibly at the end of this year. So whether we're able to 
uh, transfer that to, to resource. We haven't got a straight answer yet from Treasury. Uh, we're encouraging departments to bring forward capital schemes as best and as quickly as they can, because uh, capital spend will be one way to try and pump, pump prime economic recovery as well. Uh, but we, we're, we're, we will do that. But there's no doubt that this year, again, for different reasons, capital spend is going to continue to be challenged. But we uh, are encouraging departments at this early stage to do all they can to make sure they spend as much as we can. Call John O'Dowd for supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Lask and Collier. Uh, the Minister has referred to the £53 million underspend in his previous answers to this question. Um, he'll be aware that will come as a body blow to many business sectors who haven't received support from the Department of Economy yet. And he'll be aware the Economy Committee has been lobbying very strongly for sole traders. Will sole traders be part of the discussions moving forward on how this money should be redistributed? Well, I think all sectors who, who, who did not manage to avail of previous business support grants, and it was 65 million actually was underspent, 53 million has been returned. Uh, I think all, all sectors uh, are, should be considered, uh, and sole traders is one that we're looking at. I know there were particular difficulties when the Treasury were doing a scheme to try and identify sole traders and try and make sure that they were correctly identifying those who qualified under sole traders. So there, there is complexity to that, but that's not to say that these issues should not be looked at. And, and you'd be correct, you are correct, of course, there are, there are a range, I'm sure everyone here is aware of a range of different sectors who have come forward to say we haven't been able to avail, we have missed out on this. And I think now that this money has been surrendered back, we have an opportunity to see, because this money, while the executive is looking forward to economic recovery and how to target economic recovery, this particular pot of money was used in the middle of the pandemic to keep people afloat, if you like. And so while there are still people who have not been reached, I think there is a very valid argument for looking back to see how we can do, we achieve some of that with this uh, outstanding money. Moving on, I call Claire Sugden. Question number 10, please. I appreciate the severe impact the COVID-19 outbreak has had on childcare availability and the resulting challenges faced by parents working from home. NICS has worked hard to support staff to manage their workload against their parental caring responsibilities. Staff are supported with a blend of flexible working arrangements, the use of technology, including the provision of laptops uh, and access to tools such as WebEx, video conferencing, an additional 5,750 laptops and around 4,000 reconfigured desktops and 400 new mobile devices, tablets and smartphones have been issued to allow staff to work from home. Flexi time arrangements allow staff working from home to manage how they arrange their working hours to balance commitments. Staff can discuss and agree with their managers who are in the best position to support them how domestic arrangements, including childcare, can be managed during these very challenging times. Staff may consider applying for special leave, take annual leave, or may wish to discuss with their manager a temporary change to working patterns or contracted working hours. Managers are very much encouraged to consider all such requests sympathetically. I call Claire Sutton for supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for his response and, and I'm pleased that he was able to put on record the support that is being provided to uh, Northern Ireland civil servants as a response to COVID-19 and being able to work from home. As, as we emerge from uh, the pandemic, I, I'm getting contacted by constituents who work for the Northern Ireland Civil Service to say that they are um, being asked to come back to work and the childcare arrangements are not being taken into account. So can I ask the Minister if he would um, provide the NICS COVID-related policy to working from home to this assembly so that we can provide that to um, our constituents who are making these queries. Yes, I, I, and I'm sure I, I, I appreciate that uh, challenge it is for people coming back because, and that's why we've included childcare in the additional rates relief. That's why we're looking at childcare as a specific sector for support because childcare is, is have particular challenges in getting back in place. And of course, if they're not back in place, people cannot come back to work. So it's a kind of a chicken and egg thing. So that involves more than simply the Department of Finance, but we have a responsibility for NICS. And yes, I'm sure we can publish or, or make available uh, uh, the, the guidance in terms of that to make sure that people are, uh, are being properly looked after and, and the instruction to the managers within the civil services to be as flexible and as sympathetic as possible and to understand the challenges people are facing. And I hope that that is the case. If it's not, uh, we're more than happy to hear from you. I call Pat Catney for a supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker uh, I think I owe you an apology for the last time that, 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 that I was in here. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think I owe you an apology for the last time when I was in here. Okay, so I've seen you personally and I'm now making it publicly as well. You have a difficult task and uh, 
But I want to ask the Minister, Justin Gellert, to do with those single-person businesses, Minister, and uh, the businesses of 51,000 NAV. Uh, we need to try and give as much help out to them as possible, but on, not only in financial terms, although that is the great help. Is there a way, when you're speaking to the Treasury, not unlike uh, what, what my colleague across said about the VAT, but to look at deferred payments for those big ticket payments which businesses find themselves making at the end of the year. It would be a help and give much comfort to the businesses which are struggling now to open. I see an apology is a way to win, win their way around a, a non-supplementary question. <laughs> <laughs> I must, I must remember that particular trick if ever I end the up. The minister may choose to it. answer it or not. <laughs> I appreciate your flexibility. Can, and I just say yes. And I, I, I mean, quite a lot of uh, businesses, obviously, but also MLAs have come to us with various problems facing the business sector. And, and, and particularly keen to hear, and I, I put this out to all MLAs, keen to hear from people who, who want us to make representations to Treasury in relation to things, because we are the department that engages directly with them. And while I have a very regular engagement with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, the departmental officials are engaging on a daily basis with Treasury. And we have been able to point out to them things that have not worked properly in relation to some of their early responses, the job retention scheme, some of the loans issues, that we have been able to engage with them and say, this isn't working here for a variety of reasons. And we have secured some amendments to that and some more flexibility within those. So I'm very keen to hear that business support it isn't just simply the one package, it's going to be ongoing support and it's going to be finding ways to do things better. And for instance, the discussion, uh, as an example, that discussions which happen between infrastructure and communities about street, uh, use of street space and licensing and all that, that's all important in terms of supporting hospitality business. So it's not simply a matter of grants, it's a matter of, of engaging to make sure things are made more easy for business as well. I call Gordon Dunn to ask a supplementary question to, and to connect it with the original question. Absolutely, no doubt. The, uh, thanks, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister advise us on what measures are being put in place to encourage civil servants back to work? I know you've you touched on it. We want to ensure that they're in a safe, hygienic uh, environment which, with the adequate supports that are necessary. Yeah, I think there, there are a range of measures. One is uh, some of the issues identified by Claire Sugden that childcare is a problem. We have to recognise that people who in the childcare sector is not now functioning as it as it was, that it's more difficult for people to access that, and that, that places a difficulty. So there has to be almost a, a, a personal engagement with each civil service from their managers to see what the, the issues that are facing. We did manage because the, the initial priority was to allow people to work from home, so there was a huge drive forward in terms of technology in the provision of laptops and uh, smartphones and other devices to people and ensuring that people had the uh, technology available to, to contact and engage with the department to continue meetings and to continue work from home. Uh, but of course, yes, there is, uh, uh, the, the things are turning now to how do we get back, how do we get more people back in, and that will involve a range of measures, looking at individual circumstances, looking at things like childcare, but also looking at where people work from. Uh, you know, the, the issue which we had already begun to look at about flexi desks, about people working from uh, hubs that, you know, satellite type of arrangements around the country so people aren't spending time in the car or having to travel with other people to and from work where they have more ability to work remotely or to mo or work from hubs closer to their own homes. So there are a whole range of measures which I think will assist people back. I don't see us in any time soon getting back to full offices. I think we're going to have to continue to be flexible and operate, operate a, a variety of arrangements to try and get the best value out of our public services that we can. Uh, but those are going to be challenges for us all in every department uh, and, and the, the Department of Finance is here to assist with other departments and with the staff overall in whatever way we can. Moving on, I call Declan McAleer. Oh, good. Cast over to Henry, question 11. The uh, British Treasury has confirmed that it will, in principle, cover the infrastructure costs of checking sanitary and phytosanitary measures uh, following the end of the transition period. I will continue to engage with Treasury to ensure that all costs of implementing the protocol are covered by the Exchequer. I call Declan McAleer for supplementary. Graham uh, Algott, thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that, um, given the fact that, um, that Britain is diverging away from EU regulations and standards, that this has uh, increased the uh, need for SPS checks at our ports uh, and, our, um, and indeed our airports. Would the Minister agree that the funding the cost of this expanded infrastructure and IT systems and controls would be very unfair if it was placed, the burden, financial burden was placed here, given the fact that the North voted, uh, didn't vote to remain within the EU? 
Again, this does not connect with the original question, and I allow the Minister to decide whether he wishes to answer it or not. Well, I've been as flexible as yourself so far, so we may, we may continue on in the same vein. Uh, can I just say, in general terms, we have the, the Treasury have committed, and the British Government have committed as part of their manifesto to cover all costs associated with leaving the EU. Uh, I, from a political perspective, wish it wasn't the case that we were leaving at all, uh, but nonetheless, we want to ensure that the exit from the EU is as least damaging as it will possibly be, and I, I thoroughly expect there to be damage done. Uh, as a consequence of leaving, and, and that's why I think it needs to be done in a very careful uh, and calibrated fashion. Uh, but the, there is a commitment to cover all such costs, and I think it's, it's incumbent on myself as a finance minister and the executive as a whole to hold the government to that commitment. And I call Jonathan Buckley to connect to the original question. Thank you. And in light of costs incurred by the UK Treasury, Her Majesty's Government, would the Minister join with me in thanking Her Majesty's Treasury? in the generous contributions throughout COVID-19, which has secured lifeline for many businesses and uh, civilians across Northern Ireland. Had it not been for that uh, intervention, uh, there is no doubt that many businesses would have went under. In light of what he has said, can the Minister outline other potential financial packages or measures that may be introduced by Her Majesty's Treasury going forward in light of COVID-19? Well, I'm invited frequently from the opposition benches to thank uh, the government for their, their generosity. I'll just remind you, we pay taxes here. Uh, and, uh, and also that the, what we have uh, needed to invest in, you know, when I say the priority for investment, aside from the, the business support, which of course was very welcome, and any of this money is welcome, I have no difficulty welcoming this, uh, but we had to prioritise invest in our health service, which has been under-resourced for years uh, because of austerity measures. Vulnerable people under-resourced for years because of austerity measures. So we had to channel things into areas which the government in London have have uh, reduced our ability to spend uh, public money on over the years. In, in relation to uh, further financial packages, we aren't aware. We're told that there may be uh, announcements in uh, July. We continue to engage with Treasury to get a sense of what those announcements will be, and that will allow the executive to plan our economic recovery on the back of those. I call Matthew Till. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. A brief question. The, the, the Minister may not have seen in the last hours, he's been, as we've been asking questions here, the Treasury have said there will be what they call a summer economic update next Wednesday. Can I ask, in, in light of that and to link to the initial question, that, they ask, that he asks and the, the Executive asks for an urgent update on spending in relation to EU exit and what will be dispersed to the devolved administrations? There has been a, an, an ominous silence from London in terms of implementation of the Ireland Protocol and broader EU exit matters. Can I ask that he makes representations ahead of next Wednesday to that effect? Well, can I assure him we continue to make representation on, on issues like the uh, Shared Prosperity Fund and others which are, are replace uh, EU assistance, which we have benefited from enormously here over the years, uh, are, are very vague uh, and, and not at all encouraging in terms of, of the lack of detail. So, uh, not only ourselves, but uh, I know in the joint meetings I do with the other devolved uh, areas, the, in the Scottish and Welsh, similarly press for uh, some more detail, some more certainty in relation to all of this. So, uh, just to assure them that this is continuously on the agenda, and we will press not only for to be uh, the, the cost of the exit uh, to, to be met by the British government, but also the replacement. Uh, and the operation and the, the decision making around whatever replaces EU funds uh, to be the property of this institution. And that is the end of questions to the Minister for Finance, and I would ask members to take their ages for a few moments.